Welcome to another session of lectures by Lobezy. I'm your host, Dr. Lobezy. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the coming of the modern age, primarily uh, 1850 to 1914, so really the second half of uh, the 19th century. So the term modern, uh, sometimes we use the word modernity to refer to it or something else that we'll talk about, sort of called modernism. So what we're going to be in store for are a lot of uh, dramatic changes uh, to the way that we understand the world, and it's going to challenge traditional beliefs. Okay, so a lot of this is going to um, be in the way of innovations and technological advancements, uh, advancements but also uh, science uh, and philosophy. Okay, so after we discuss all of that, we'll wrap the video up uh, by discussing uh, some of the emerging uh, social classes, specifically the middle and the working class. One of the most important uh, naturalists or scientists that we'll be discussing is Charles Darwin. But before we get to him, I want to just mention this idea uh, that many Christians had and was, you know, commonly uh, believed by many that uh, the earth was not terribly old um, and a lot of people derived that understanding from the Bible. Well, uh, we, we start to see geologists begin to study um, the earth and they realize that the earth is in fact very old and uh, that there are uh, certain natural laws that uh, not only govern the universe, but also govern the earth. And if these natural laws are true, then uh, the earth is much older uh, than we've come to believe. Okay. So that's going to sort of set us up for uh, our understandings of how people change uh, over time as well, and uh, or that species of animals change. Before we get to um, Darwin want to talk about a French naturalist uh, who sort of is the predecessor of uh, Darwin and his name is Jean-Baptiste Lamarck and uh, he studied uh, animals and in this illustration in this drawing I think it does a good job of summing up his understanding how animals change. He said that animals um, struggle uh, for food to gain food and uh, that struggling causes the, their bodies uh, to change. And so you can see this giraffe, uh, th because it struggles to reach higher branches, it is in fact causing its neck uh, to grow. And that those changes that that giraffe uh, goes through in its lifetime can be passed on to the next generation. So uh, even though he's talking correctly about how species change, he is incorrect in his understanding of just how rapidly uh, it takes place. Uh, so he's incorrect to think that it could happen in an animal's uh, own lifetime. Okay, so those changes are multiplied out by hundreds of generations. All right, and so that brings us to Charles Darwin, um, the uh, British naturalist who traveled aboard a boat uh, all across the world. And when he reached uh, the Galapagos right here off the coast of South America along the equator, he discovered a lot of uh, diverse life uh, in a couple of different types of animals, but specifically these birds called finches. And what he noticed is that aside from their beaks, these finches were pretty much the same. And he postulated that they had a common uh, ancestor and that he used these finches and other animals to develop his theory of uh, evolution, which is based on natural selection. And that is this understanding that since food is uh, limited, uh, that there's a finite amount of food, that it causes animals to have to compete for food and only those animals that are uh, best suited for survival will do so. And so that's where this uh, notion, uh, survival of the fittest comes from. And um, so that uh, theory 
comes to us by way of uh, his book, The Origin of the Species, okay, by means of natural selection, uh, published in 1859, all right? And so that uh, theory was, for the most part, uh, accepted without a tremendous amount of uh, pushback. However, in his next book or later book, uh, The Descent of Man, Darwin uh, takes one takes another step uh, and says that uh, humans are evolved from uh, more primitive species. And this book um, was uh, challenged uh, by organized religion, uh, the Catholic Church, and by a lot of people in society because uh, if, if what he is saying is true, then uh, many people interpreted that to mean that the Bible, the Old Testament, the idea, if, if you go all the way back to the first book of the Old Testament, which is Genesis, the story of creation is laid down. And so it seemed as if his book was challenging that very theory uh, that, you know, God created all of um, all of the animals uh, of the world and that they haven't changed uh, at all. OK, and so a lot of people took this um, book and this, you know, the theories of Charles Darwin, and there was a lot of pushback uh, for that. Um, the next person I want to talk about is uh, Herbert Spencer uh, pictured here, and he is responsible for taking Charles Darwin's theories and applying it to humans by saying that uh, societies like animals uh, compete and that those that are the, the fittest not only survive, but they, uh, they do well. And um, because in the animal kingdom, you know, it is expected that certain animals should survive while others do not, that so too in humanity, uh, some cultures or civilizations or peoples are better equipped to survive and with all things being equal, that that sort of gives um, those stronger civilizations the right to conquer uh, the weaker ones. Okay, and so that's going to give rise to imperialism. And when we get to World War One, two with nationalism and even beyond, uh, racialists or people who believed that their particular ethnic group was the most um, dominant in the world, you know, they have a right to therefore uh, flex their muscles and, you know, at the expense of weaker people and take them over. Okay. And so this is going to have uh, social Darwinism will have uh, pretty, pretty expansive consequences. Okay. So, yeah, this, this again, this slide here just talks about how his, uh, Charles Darwin's views uh, with mankind, as far as that goes, uh, tended to um, challenge uh, traditional interpretations of uh, religion, okay? And so a lot of um, devout Christians had a problem with it. Over time, though, um, Christianity, specifically the Catholic Church says, well, when it comes to the Bible, uh, certain aspects of it should not be taken literally, uh, that there is uh, some, I guess, room for f uh, figurative uh, interpretations. And so uh, th the idea then of uh, creation as handed down to us in the book of Genesis isn't, isn't necessary for us to believe wholeheartedly or literally. Um, there are deeper truths that are more important than that. Uh, okay, so some of the other uh, people that we should mention, just very quickly, uh, Dmitry Mendeleev and uh, the study of the periodic table. He's the one who developed the periodic table of the elements, uh, and he was smart enough to realize that not all of the elements were known and that he left room for uh, later discoveries, okay? And so... Chemistry and physics will um, advance the idea that, you know, there are building blocks that exist that are not visible by the naked eye. And that includes, you know, subatomic 
um, or just atoms in general, and then later subatomic um, substances. Okay, uh, somebody else that is important is uh, this Russian scientist uh, Pavlov, uh, who uh, worked with with animals uh, and this idea of the conditioned reflex. So by ringing a bell um, while feeding animals, uh, he could cause the dogs to salivate. Uh, and then um, he could remove the uh, food and just simply ring the bell. And that would uh, still cause the dog to salivate. And so what that has to do with is the conditioned response. Okay, so the next uh, field of study is going to be sociology, and so uh, the modern age, you know, we're going to see the creation of this uh, this social science, and uh, it's kind of connected to something else um, known as positivism. Uh, and just simply put, uh, positivism is uh, this idea that human understanding and truth, I should say, is most linked to the ability to prove um something with like scientific uh, evidence and uh, the use uh, that data uh, has and plays and all of that and so for something to be true it must be backed up not just by uh, reason and logic but uh, mathematical evidence or evidence that can be you know uh, demonstrated mathematically okay uh, but that uh, field uh, sociology is just this idea that uh, natural laws exist uh, with regard to how humans and uh, live and interact with one another and the whole goal of sociology is to you know remake society improve society uh, so this stems back to the enlightenment this idea of self-improvement and stuff like that and that that's going to um, lead to greater human happiness okay so sociology uh, is uh, an important field brand new but uh, an important field of study nonetheless okay next slide uh okay so here's a big one and this has to do with healthcare. so really little improvements uh have been made with science i mean with uh medicine even though the scientific revolution has taken place um as far as uh, the way doctors have treated uh their patients little has changed uh, since the middle ages okay so we're going to be we're on the the precipice of vast changes taking place okay and the first one is going to come from louis pasteur all right french chemist and he is going to be responsible for what is known as the germ theory of disease okay um as you probably already know uh what, what people had believed uh, all the way back since the the middle ages is that disease is caused by something called miasma and that is this idea that um, disease go, uh, spreads through foul smelling air and um, you know they they had a correlational uh, understanding that typically you know when you had foul smelling decaying whatever it was uh, that you know that common sense teaches you that that's not very sanitary um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the cause of disease so it was not until um, the late 1800s under Louis Pasteur and some other scientists that real improvements in, in uh, medical care are made possible and so it, the first is through the discovery of the germ theory of disease okay and so i'll just walk you through a little bit of this um, so that you understand um, but his work with what is now called pasteurization uh, heating uh, certain liquids up to kill the uh, the germs uh, that were present in in these liquids like milk uh, and wine and beer and he noticed that they, there, there were these you know bacterial growths by looking at them under a microscope but what he didn't understand is that they were necessarily bad and that they were responsible for the spoilage that takes place and so by heating the liquids up to a certain temperature he could kill those bacteria and then therefore like extend the life of the milk or the wine or the uh, beer okay and so what he realized is those bacteria were bad and that they were linked to disease okay and so that's 
in a nutshell, how the germ theory of disease comes about. Uh, this uh, newspaper uh, looks to be like a political cartoon shows him treating some kind of rabid uh, animal with uh, like a vaccine. Okay, and so uh, he did some work later on on uh, developing a vaccine, um, especially for rabies. Okay, next slide. German uh, doctor Robert Koch is responsible uh, for the discovery of the bacteria that cause uh, two of the most deadly diseases of the 19th century, and they are tuberculosis and cholera. And uh, you can see here that uh, tuberculosis was responsible. Uh, it's a lung ailment, and it's uh, highly contagious, uh, responsible for the deaths of 30 million people during the 1800s. Okay, and so uh, later doctors are able to come up with, you know, some vaccinations to help cure uh, some of the more deadly diseases of the 19th century. Okay, and then another doctor that's uh, important is Scottish doctor uh, Joseph Lister. And so he is going to be responsible uh, for making huge advancements in surgeries. Okay, and so he treated patients that had uh, a variety of different ailments. And, you know, the biggest problem with uh, these patients is if you would operate on them, they would, they would uh, die from infection, okay? And so, you know, there are all sorts of concerns for uh, surgeries. I mean, what, what, one of the, the only effective things that doctors could do is amputations. And, um, you know, the idea is they had to be able to amputate the patient as, you know, whatever the diseased uh, or affected limb was as quick as possible uh, because the patient would go into shock or the patient would die from blood loss. And so, you know, there were very few practical uh, applications for surgery. Um, even patients who had compound uh, fractures, doctors weren't very um, keen to operate on them because if they did, uh, they, they could die from, you know, they could fix the the compound fracture uh, but then the patient could die from infection okay and so what a compound fracture is when the bone is you know kind of sticking out of the skin and so he spent his career um, studying this and trying to you know come up with cures for what were just sort of considered um, um, hospital um, gangrene hospital gangrene and so um he was able to come up with what is called an antiseptic all right because when after, after they operate on a patient uh the chances that the patient could go septic meaning that the wound uh, site can become infected and then that, that'll spread and ultimately kill the patient so he developed an antiseptic all right and it was called carbolic acid and by treating the wound site and uh sterilizing the equipment uh, and the surgical knives and things like that, you know, utensils uh, with this uh, carbolic acid, uh, all of a sudden patients begin, you know, surviving uh, and very few complications. And so uh, because of that, the surgeons become much more popular and much more prestigious. Okay. And so that's uh, all thanks to Joseph Lister. Okay. So the next slide, I uh, want to talk about three great thinkers who uh, are going to radically alter uh, the way that we understand the, the natural world, uh, the way that we understand the universe. They're going to pretty much turn everything on its head, okay? Because they are going to make discoveries that challenge what we're capable of knowing. And um, the first is Albert Einstein. So with physics, the last time we discussed it, uh, it was Sir Isaac Newton. And so Isaac Newton had developed uh, the uh, universal law of gravitation, which, you know, uh, for many, uh, we used the, um, the metaphor that the universe was much like a clock, okay? And that God, the clockmaker, had created this uh, instrument, uh, this machine, if you will, that was uh, perfectly orderly, and um, predictable and that we had the ability to study and therefore understand the workings of the universe. 
So when Albert Einstein comes along, he kind of flips that on its head. Now, so what we say about him is that he doesn't necessarily disprove because he doesn't, um, you know, Newton's laws of motion and things like that are still true, but he just uh, places limits on what Newton um, discovered. So there was, you know, like limitations to his uh, physics. And so Albert Einstein comes along, comes up with the, um, you know, the theory of relativity. And that, and that is that space, time, and motion are not absolute, okay? And so this is, this idea of laws of absolutes um, really begin to, like, challenge uh, rational understanding. And so new terms to kind of describe this, uh, uh, this way of knowing is now, know, uh, is now called irrational or irrationality. Uh, but very quickly, uh, in layman's terms, uh, the best way to understand or the best way to sort of communicate the idea of relativity is if you were to, um, let's say, ask, okay, about speed, all right? So if you were studying a train um, and you wanted to, uh, you know, uh, determine the speed that the train that is traveling on its tracks, you wanted to determine that. Well, um the question that Albert Einstein would have and relativists would be, well, from whose perspective um, are, are you asking that? Are you asking that um, from somebody standing on the ground watching the train go by? Are you, uh, what if there is a passenger aboard the train? Let's say, you know, to the person standing uh, on the, on the, on the ground and, the train passes them, maybe it's traveling 40, 50 miles per hour. But if, let's say a passenger, uh, according to the passenger's perspective, uh, the train may not be traveling well. What if the passenger, let's say, is walking uh, in the opposite direction on the train? He's walking aboard the train, maybe to another uh, cart, uh, a train car, and uh, He's traveling in the opposite direction that the train is going. Well, you know, relative to him, what, how fast is the train? And then I think the way the story goes is if somebody was traveling in outer space and said, you know, compa compared to that person's perspective, how fast would the train be traveling? So it just opens the door for a lot of different interpretations. And so um, Einstein's theory of relativity uh not only uh, creates a lot of new knowledge, but um, is going to create challenges because it, it, people aren't sure what to do with it, okay? With, with this new understanding, it's very confusing. It's very contrary to what we had been uh, taught, you know, ever since the scientific revolution and the enlightenment that the universe was knowable. Uh, and, that, and now we're learning that uh, the, the universe is anything but knowable, that it is disorderly, chaotic, um, and not predictable, okay? So that term chaos is going to be introduced and that is going to be unsettling for many people. And I'll just say this now, um, <clears throat> it takes a long time for the work of Albert Einstein and some of the layers that I'm, some of the um, other thinkers I'm going to discuss, it, it's going to take a while before their work becomes uh, in vogue and popular. And uh, in, in fact, you know, even though they predate um, the uh, World War One, their work doesn't often become at super popular until after World War One, And so it only adds to the confusion and the uncertainty that World War One created because um, people just are left at the end of World War One just broken, especially considering, you know, how many people died during that global conflict. And so that uncertainty uh, of that time period is just made worse by the, you know, the way that people come to understand and interpret the work of Einstein um, and others, uh, like Sigmund Freud, the next person we'll be talking about. All right, so Sigmund Freud is uh, significant because he introduces a new, a new field of study known as psychoanalysis, and it is uh, how to deal with uh, and how to understand and treat um, the, the human mind uh, in psychoses.
that exist within the human mind. Okay, so understanding the 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 mind as opposed to the brain uh, was what you know Sigmund Freud was most interested in, and so he um, he worked with uh, doctors in uh, hospitals, um, you know, working with patients who suffered from quote unquote hysteria. Okay. And so over time he developed, you know, a series of theories, but <clears throat> the, the, the basis to it is that the mind is made up of two parts. Um, well, he's going to divide the mind in a lot of different parts, but from its most basic is you have your conscious mind and your unconscious mind. And if you can kind of look in this uh, picture right here, you can see that the conscious mind is actually very small and what's large is the unconscious mind. So he kind of, a good way to um, compare it is to like a, a glacier. Okay. And so the unconscious mind is obviously that part of the mind that we're unaware of and it's bigger. And according to Sigmund Freud, it's most responsible for the way that we act. Okay. So people never thought, um, that we were um, unable to control our mind, uh, that our actions, you know, the the way we behave, uh, everyone assumed that people had the ability to control their actions. And what Sigmund Freud's work is going to symbolize is that oftentimes people are compelled and driven to do things uh, by their unconscious mind. Okay. And so, uh, the study of, you know, these patients who were suffering from hysterics led him to delve into their past. And um, he, he, he came to the conclusion that oftentimes people who were suffering from hysteria or of one type or another also were dealing with suppressed memories or, yeah, suppressed memories, something that might have been traumatic uh, in their perhaps childhood, you know, that had taken place and they had buried it uh, deep within uh, their mind and the, you know, the deep recesses of their mind and that, um, you know, this, uh, th this suppressed memory was uh, having, you know, uh, an adverse effect on their personality or the, you know, is responsible for their behavior. Okay. And so there are many, you know, parts to, to this, but um, he was the first to sort of, postulate this idea that our mind is not necessarily, um, that we aren't necessarily capable of always uh, controlling our behavior. Okay. And so again, he subdivides the mind into like our unconscious mind into what he calls the id, the ego and the super ego, super ego. And that is like a battlefield that takes place. And so oftentimes, uh, it, it's that battlefield that um, is what is actually going to be responsible for the way that we be, uh, we behave. Okay, and so you can imagine um, just how the, this new understanding is is going to um, kind of fly in the face of traditional understanding. Okay, uh, the next uh, thinker that we need to talk about is Friedrich Nietzsche, and he's probably the most confusing of them all. He is a philosopher. Okay. And you know, one of the biggest statements that should jump right out at you is that he rejected Christianity and it's what we're going to see. And a lot of this is probably, if I go back to the word positivism, this idea that, you know, truth can't be understood unless it can be proven. This I would say is, you know, you know, at the end of the 19th century into the beginning of the 20th century, this is where we're, we're, going to get to the point where people are atheists. Um, you know, they're, people are going to, and, and typically it's scientists who are going to reject the, the, uh, the notion of Christianity. Uh, and, and it's because of that positive as an understanding that truth doesn't exist unless it can be proven, you know, well, that's the whole basis of religion is something, you know, a belief system or, or faith. And so you can't, you can't prove that. And so oftentimes that's why, scientists uh, will reject the, the notion of Christianity or just any type of organized religion. Okay. Anyway, <clears throat> his work is not so much about him having one opinion, you know, about the existence of God. 
or another, um, he, his is the problem that he has that he believes Christianity, like the, the role that Christianity has played in making, uh, humans, um, weaker, I guess, uh, and overly, um, virtuous. And it's not so much that humans are um, governed by various virtues. It's just he has a problem with um, the virtues that Christianity has adopted, uh, you know, like uh, forgiveness um, and, uh, you know, hope, love and charity, which are, you know, Christian virtues. He says that those virtues that have been adopted by humans, uh, West, you know, the Western civilization has uh, made people uh, weak and uh, flabby and uh, uh, not as courageous uh, or creative as they once were. And that this is going to re result in the downfall of Western civilization. And so um, he surmises that humans, you know, Westerners, Europeans, are going to have to find a new um, a new source of inspiration. Okay, that Christianity is no longer going to help. That um, if civilization, European civilization, Western civilization is going to continue to progress and advance, it's going to have to find a new set of virtues. And um, for some, the idea that God is dead, to God is dead, you know, to use his words, um, for many that could be disconcerting, that can be uh, scary. He says, you know, that's actually the wrong way to look at it. Um, it's good to maybe introduce a term called nihilism. Um, and really, at its root, nihilism is a belief in nothingness. Um, and that um, the term nihilism oftentimes is uh, pretty dark um, and is associated with people who think that there's nothing to live for. And so oftentimes people who are nihilistic um, can be destructive um, to, their, to themselves uh, or to others. And um, nihilism, <clears throat> a belief in nothingness, is is not a uh, you know you don't want a society based on that because uh, obvious for obvious reasons. Um, so when Friedrich Nietzsche says that um, you know God is dead, he doesn't want people to move t towards nihilism. He wants them to be liberated and uh, discover new um, virtues and values. And he says. When that happens, um, people will follow. And so he used the term ubermensch, uh, people who weren't confined by the virtues of Christianity, that they will uh, act and regain their strength and will be a source of inspiration for others. Okay, so if that wasn't enough, let's, uh, let's talk about some... Uh, uh, important people as far as innovators in technology go. Okay, so we want to talk about uh, the coming of the second industrial revolution. Okay, so with the second industrial revolution, we're going to talk about the importance that steel uh, plays in like electricity and um, uh, gasoline, uh, petroleum products and stuff like that. Okay, so uh, the age of steel is made possible uh, by Henry Bessemer at something known as the Bessemer process. And so what this does is um, it, he comes up with a way to make uh, or mass produce steel. Okay, and so steel is going to become the in, new building product of the second industrial revolution. It's going to uh, replace iron. Uh, because it is stronger and uh, more lightweight, okay? And so um, because of that, um, we're going to see uh, the birth of um, really tall buildings called skyscrapers, okay? And I think, I think it's, I don't know, eight to ten stories, um, sort of, it, you know, by today's standards, that's not a skyscraper, but 
they had you know limitations so prior to the widespread use of um, steel uh, brought to us by the Bessemer process yeah buildings were kind of limited to be you know like like under under eight stories okay and so really uh, after that you know the sky's the limit ha 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 okay uh, so that is uh, important okay and as is the uh, invention of uh, <laughs> dynamite uh, dynamite is going to be an important uh, 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 product uh, for for growth in countries okay it's going to it's going to allow um, uh, people and engineers to um, blast through mountains so that they can uh, extend the reach of railroads okay and so um, you know that invention uh, by Alfred Noble um, is interesting because uh, it was an improvement over nitroglycerin. So nitroglycerin had been used uh, as as an explosive, you know, for uh, like I said, you know, for uh, people building railroad, you know, uh, passages and tunnels and stuff like that. Uh, <clears throat> so interesting little side story the death of his uh his brother was picked up by the newspapers and because um his invention alfred nobel's invention of dynamite uh, could be used uh to uh, make weapons um he gets a very bad obituary and describes him um they describe him as somebody who has profited uh, off of uh, the you know the death of others and so he, he is um, concerned about that. And so the money that he makes um, for, from the sale of dynamite, he is going to make sure he puts it to a good use, a better use, um, he thinks, and he establishes what is known as the Nobel Peace Prize or the Nobel Prize, um, which cash prizes will be awarded to uh, new discoveries in science and, uh, and math. All right, so the next um, inventor, if you will, that we want to discuss is Michael Faraday, and uh, it's his invention of the electric motor, motor, or sometimes known as the dynamo, uh, which is, allows us to deviate from steam power, and it's the advent of modern electricity, okay? And so electricity is going to be, you know, the new source of power, okay? And um, yeah, it's... It's going to have huge implications, um, and not only that, uh, the you know the later invention uh, by Thomas Edison of the light bulb is going to have huge ramifications as far as like productivity and factories and stuff like that, which had typically been forced to you know shut down uh, when the sun goes down, and so this is going to or they be kept open unsafely, you know, with kerosene lamps and things like that which there was always the danger of fire. And so with uh, the, the electric dynamo, um, as, you know, sources of power uh, can be connected um, by wires and then factories and, and you know, people's homes can be made safer. And with, with, the, uh, with the advent of the uh, modern light bulb, incandescent light bulb, okay? Uh, so the next guys, uh, or the next gentleman that we want to talk about is uh, Gottlieb Daimler, okay? And so he and many uh, others are going to experiment with, uh, a lot of guys that were bicycle makers are going to take the, uh, or, or uh, horse carriages, and they're going to try to make a um, internal combustion engine vehicle, okay? And so Gottlieb Daimler, Daimler is going to be the first one responsible for uh, taking this internal combustion uh, engine and mounting it onto a carriage body uh, to make the very first automobile. So as I said, others will follow in its footsteps and, um, you know, a lot of those guys will be um, uh, bicycle makers um, and, you know, try to use that skill. But uh, so the automobile initially is just kind of like a, a novel idea and it's just kind of like a toy, really. Uh, <clears throat> there's not a, a huge... Uh, practical purpose yet for the automobile and a lot of that has to do with 
because they're all handmade and they're expensive and if uh, a lot of move a lot of movable parts and if something breaks you know you almost have to discard the whole vehicle um, because there aren't um, you know ways to get uh, new pieces uh, or new parts that line up you know exactly the the way that the previous pieces and so a lot of that's going to change with the advent of the um, mass production uh, the assembly line uh, brought to us by henry ford okay so but just the importance of um, the internal combustion engine and petroleum products for transportation so obviously you know the automobile but then that's going to give rise to um the airplane by the uh by the Wright brothers, um, Kitty Hawk, North, uh, North Carolina, in 1903. Okay, so that's that's going to do it for this video. I knew I know I talked about uh, that the video would continue discussing the middle and the uh, working classes. We'll just do that uh, for another video. But uh, thanks for watching. Catch you next time.